After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given the power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Uh, all, I know it's not in uh, the bulletin if you're looking, but I'm just going to read the names of the tribes. So this is 12,000 each sealed from Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for bringing us here, Lord, and thank you that you promise to be with us where every one or two or three are gathered together in your name. Lord, we ask that you would open the scripture to us, that you would speak through me by your spirit, and that in our time you would be glorified, that you would be known as you make yourself known to us, and that you would draw us to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As Adam said, my name is Terry Dykstra. I've been with y'all before, but it's been a little while. I have been the campus minister for RUF International for the last five years. RUF just stands for Reformed University Fellowship. It's, our, it's the PCA's uh, ministry to college students. RUF International is the PCA's ministry to international college students in the United States. That's all obviously a mouthful. If it's easier, if it's helpful, you can just think of me as Emmanuel's assistant pastor to international students at the University of Texas. Uh, but I'm grateful, uh, as always, for the support, for the prayer of Emmanuel in the work. Um, and I'm glad to be with you uh, to preach while Greg is enjoying his sabbatical to give Adam a week off. Um, so thank you all so much for having me this morning. Did anybody see the James Webb telescope pictures this week? I see some nods, yeah. Yeah, they were, they were so beautiful, right? And just like so amazing, just, you know, pictures of the universe, which, which still is not, I guess, like all encompassing, but you see so many galaxies uh, in sort of the middle of that big picture, the two sort of galaxies or stars that were, um, the article from NASA, I guess, said that we're sort of like dancing around each other, and I guess we're on their way to forming a black hole or another star or something. And uh, another one of the great pictures, I mean, they're all amazing and incredible, right? But the Carina Nebula was this sort of brown, like, cloud, you know? Um, and there was a, an article on the Gospel Coalition talking about the Carina Nebula, especially saying, but about all of it, you know, with the nebula, with its light years high cliffs, you know, seeing all that for the first time, this writer said, God made these things and made all of this to be beautiful, 
but no human had seen it until those pictures were released. And that tells us something about the greatness of God, his transcendence, right? Um, but also uh, how much he enjoys beauty, right? That he made it uh, for his enjoyment, that we you know, now have been able to see it, but had not seen it before, no human ever had. And this passage that we're looking at from Revelation chapter seven shows us a similarly beautiful picture that no human had seen until John saw it and wrote about it for our benefit. But like the pictures from the telescope, we see it in scripture, but we also can look forward to seeing it one day if our faith is in Jesus. I love this passage this, this past year in RUF International, our weekly uh, dinners and Bible discussions that we do with the international students. In the fall semester, we sort of did, is brief, we only had like 10 weeks, but uh, a biblical overview basically of where we belong, like where did God make us to be, and what is our purpose. And then in the spring, we followed that up with who are the people of God? Who do we belong to? Who, who is in the family of God? And this was all to summarize the story of the Bible. Leslie Newbegin, who's a famous missionary, uh, calls the Bible the true story of the whole world. So that was sort of the framework that we used this year as we went from Genesis to Revelation, uh, both semesters. And, and while Newbegin, while we might call it a story, it's not a fiction, but it, as he says, is the true story of everything, the true story of the whole world. Looking at this chapter, Revelation 7 especially, uh, there was one quote about it that I love that said, this is from a book called Woke Church, the author is Eric Mason. He says, the earth was such a mess that the angel had to hurry up and bring John to heaven to see what things will be like so that he wouldn't be discouraged. If John, you know, in his time, obviously the early church uh, was a struggle, but if he needed help in perspective, how much more do we today need help in perspective? Revelation obviously is, is a tricky book, uh, even more tricky when the visiting pastor is coming in and giving you like a one-off sermon on it. Um, but grateful for y'all for humoring me with this. And I'll, I'll explain as much as I can and as much as is helpful, but if you're already kind of like, man, Revelation, like what is going on? We're like jumping in the middle already. Um, there's some good reminders in both the beginning and the end of Revelation. Uh, chapter one, verse three says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And then in chapter 22, verse seven, Jesus says, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And so both of those were pointed out to me. Nancy Guthrie has a book called Blessed that goes through Revelation. Um, and that was basically like her premise of the book that like, it's a hard book, but it also tells us that it's good to read it. It's good to consider it and it's good to keep it. And Guthrie especially says that, you know, while it is about the future, it's not about the future in a vacuum of future removed from us. In telling us about the future, God is showing us what to do. He's showing us who we are to be and even what we can expect to endure as we wait for Jesus to return. So all I have to say, this was the final passage that we looked at with students uh, this past spring. Um, and as I titled this sermon, our, our discussion was, this is the family picture that God gives us for what he's doing and for who his people are. It shows us where we belong, it shows us to whom we belong, and it even shows us more than that. But just like John experienced, John who's the writer of Revelation who sees all these things, life waiting for Jesus is hard. And Jesus promises that it will be, but, in his kindness and his grace to us, he shows us what he's doing and what he will do for us. So the first thing that God shows us in this passage are the people. People, of course, were the culmination of creation in Genesis, right? God said, let us make man in our image, male and female, he created them. And we believe that to mean that he made us to reflect him, right? To reflect 
things that are true about him. And he also commanded the first people to fill the earth and subdue it, to reflect God himself to the ends of the earth. His authority, his beauty, his order, his creativity, those are just some of the ways that we image God, but, but that's what God wanted to fill the earth with, with his reflections, with his image bearers. And it was always God's intent to work through people, uh, that they would be complete. Of course, he said of Adam, it is not good that the man is alone. So he made the woman from the man. But God himself also enjoyed communion with them. He was present in the garden with them. He would visit them. He would walk with them. And they had joy in their relationship with him. And that was, of course, all before sin entered the garden, entered earth, bringing death, right? Separating people from God, but also separating and breaking uh, our closeness and our relationships with each other. But throughout scripture, we see God continue to call people to accomplish his purposes. He called Abram in Genesis, who he renamed Abraham. He promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations and was the father of Israel. The nation blessed to be a blessing to the ends of the earth, much like those first people were blessed. It was for their benefit, but it was also for the benefit of the whole creation. So that's basically a a super brief summary of the Bible. Um, But it brings us, I think that's helpful as far as like context for our passage this morning. We see in that first paragraph, the four angels on the four corners holding back judgment until the people belonging to God can be sealed. That is that they can be marked as belonging to God. And we get to this list, again, it's not in the bulletin, uh, which was what I told Adam to do just because it takes up a lot of space, but you can find it in your Bible in verses five through eight. We get this list of 144,000 people. And you know, if we think about that, there's about eight billion people alive today. So not even counting everybody that has lived before everybody that's alive now, 144,000 is only almost two billionths of a percent of the people alive today. And if you're a visual person like me, that's basically a decimal point and four zeros before you get to a non-zero number. Uh, so that's, that's very small. So the question with this list often is, is this like for real? Is this list literal? And if not, like what does it mean? Because Revelation Literary genre is important in interpreting texts. It's um, apocalyptic literature, so there's a lot of symbolism. John uses a lot of images from what he sees. For our purposes, the numbers um, that we'll talk about are the numbers four, 10, and 12. We see the four angels at the four corners. Four throughout scripture is used to basically show like the entire earth or the entire Uh, global, universal creation. And so that's what the four angels, the four corners uh, signify. The number 10 is a number for completeness. It's used um, especially for emphasis, as we'll see in a second. And then number 12 is also completeness, but that's more in the context of like God's people and of God's creation. And we see that with the 12 tribes of Israel. We see that with the 12 apostles. They were both kind of signifiers of uh, God calling all people to follow him, Um, the totality. And so 12 times 12 obviously gives us 144, but then times 10, three times is for emphasis essentially. So that's where we get 1,000. All that is significant. But it's also the listing and the order of the 12 tribes is also significant. Reuben was the firstborn, so he should have been listed first, Uh, but Judah is listed first. And so the next question for that is, as with the list itself, why? Um, I think it was Nancy Guthrie who even said, it's a fulfillment of Jacob's words in Genesis 49.10. He says there, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Uh, In addition to Judah being listed first, the tribes of Ephraim and Dan are not listed. 
After the split of the two kingdoms, uh, those tribes erected golden calves and did not come to repentance. Uh, So that is significant as far as they're being listed here, and Joseph is also listed. So that's a lot of the symbolism that's happening in this list. It's a lot. Um, Thank you for bearing with me through that. Um, But because there's a lot of symbolism, because, again, it's apocalyptic literature, that tells us that this list of 144,000 is symbolic. And we see in verse 9 also So John has heard the 144,000, but verse nine, he says, and this uh, is in the bulletin, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. So this is also telling us this list is symbolic because when I look and see, I see more than 144,000 people. I see an innumerable multitude from every nation, from all tribes and tongues. And this is not the first time in Revelation that John has seen something different from what he heard. In chapter five, the elder tells John that the lion of the tribe of Judah can open the seals of the scroll. And then in verse six of chapter five, John sees between the throne and the creatures a lamb standing as though slain. So obviously a lamb and a lion are not the same, but he's showing us then as he's showing us here they symbolize the same thing, or they represent the same thing. The lion and the lamb, of course, uh, imaging Jesus. So, this crowd that he sees is a fulfillment of what he hears. And what he sees is this beautiful crowd of people. It's innumerable, it's diverse, and it is complete. It includes everyone, all tribes, all nations, all languages. And that brings us to the second piece of this passage. All of our points start with P. Um, There's three of them. So the first one is people. The second piece of this passage is the place. Despite such a beautiful and robust diversity, we see that the people are united. They are standing before the throne and before the Lamb. We're not used to being around thrones, but standing is not what you would do. Uh, You would have to bow down unless you were called, unless you were invited, or unless you were part of the family. So it's significant that this innumerable crowd is standing before the throne, but we also see that they're clothed in white, and that they have palm branches signaling victory. That's, of course, what we do on Palm Sunday as well. And lastly, in verse 10, they are united in praise of God. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. One commentator said, A crowd this diverse, you wouldn't expect any unity, but they are united in praise of the one true God as they stand before his throne. So this amazing, beautiful, diverse collection of people are in God's throne room and are standing as only the children of the king could. Tim Keller, who's a pastor in New York and writer, he has this great quote that I love. I probably have said it. Um another time I've been here, but he says, who else but the king, but the child of a king could wake up the king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water? Um, Who else besides the children of a king could stand before his throne without fear of a punishment or anything else? This crowd, this, this collection of God's children are united in praise and are united in victory, and they are wearing the robes that were washed white in the blood of the lamb. So the place is God's kingdom, even into his throne room, even intimately with the king, where God, where his people, this collection of people are victorious. And the final point of our passage this morning is we see the promise of God's salvation. Look again at verses 15 to 17. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Those in Christ are protected. They're sheltered by God's very presence. And all of this is a result of washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb, of trusting in Jesus by faith. 
They won't be lacking in needs. They won't be hungry or thirsty. They'll have protection. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Amen? Um, I love that verse, especially these last few months. Our shepherd, Jesus, the good shepherd, will guide us to the springs of living water, and he is the source of those living waters as he tells the woman from Samaria in John chapter four. And lastly, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I love this verse too because Arthur, my uh, oldest son, he's four now. Um, Anytime he cries um, or is sad, he'll (laughs) he'll say, wipe my eyes. and it's, you know, it's really sweet. Uh, it's really just a sweet moment whenever I get to wipe his eyes. Um, but the most I can do is just literally um, dry his face off. Uh, the cause of his sadness and his sadness itself is usually still there. But what this verse is talking about, verse 17, is more than just kind of drying our faces off or wiping physically wiping tears off of our eyes. One pastor described it as God literally like reaching into the tear ducts to remove the tear. Uh, The verb is basically the opposite of anointing. So it's literally like removing the water from its source. And that tells us that God isn't just covering our sadness. He's not just wiping it away. But as C.S. Lewis says, all sad things will come untrue. God is gonna remove the source of our sadness because of what he has done with his son and through his son Jesus. Each of these things, the people, the place, and the promise fulfill everything that we see in scripture. For people, again, we talked about how we are made in God's image to reflect his beauty, to reflect his order, his diversity, and his truth to the ends of the earth. That we are charged to fill the whole earth and subdue it. And we see the culmination of that, right? We see this family picture of this innumerable multitude from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, which this passage shows us and tells us it was the fulfillment of Israel, of God's chosen people, and therefore of the church. God's promise to Abraham was to be a father of many nations, and we see that fulfilled here. And I love doing the ministry of RUF International because as we gather, you know, students from a handful of countries um, every week. It's a small slice of this picture that we see here, right? That we can be together, that we can be in God's word, and that we can praise him and even be united in praise of him. As far as the place, as in Eden, we see that God is back living with his people and that we are where we belong and we are where God reigns. We are in his kingdom and that's why Jesus in his ministry talks about the kingdom of God all throughout. It's, it's a beautiful place, you know, even more than the places like the disciples thought Israel, or even like we might think America, it's even better than our best imagination of any of the places that we know. And that's all because of the promise. Again, God's promise to Abraham that I mentioned, but also the beginning when things were good and were even very good. Things will be the way that they're supposed to be. There's not gonna be evil, there's not gonna be sadness, there's not gonna be hurt anymore. And this, you know, again, Revelation is kinda wild. There's some stuff that doesn't make sense to us and, and things that we can even have a hard time imagining. But this picture that God gives us is not abstract. It is a beautiful picture of something real, just like the images from the James Webb telescope. It shows us what God is doing, and it shows us if our faith is in Jesus, if our dependence is on him, it shows us the family picture where we will be. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for your word to us. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Um, Thank you that you're bringing the ends of the earth to you, uh, peoples from all nations and tribes and tongues and languages. Lord, we pray that you give us glimpses of that here and now and as we go from here. But Lord, please continue to work in us. Please draw us to yourself. And please, God, show us your beauty, your love, and give us hope for that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.